Good morning. Please have a seat. <laughs> How is everybody? Good. It's good to see you all here. How many of you are happy to be seeing this? <laughs> oh, you want to cut it? He wants, he's brought his razor. Everybody wants a chance. We, we can auction that off, you know. <laughs> we should do that. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking I've seen him wince a couple of times, and I'm wondering how many people actually enjoyed that. <laughs> um, happy Memorial Day weekend. I, I know we, I don't know if any of our servicemen are here, but if, do we have servicemen here? Stood, if you'd stand please, and... We'd like to thank you for your service. Thank you all for your service. And, and you know, I know Memorial Day is really to celebrate those who lost. And if those of you who have served knows people who lost or suffered, um, our prayers and our peace to you for that. Um, we know that's got to be hard. And also, you know, just a moment, too, for all that we have lost, you know, in our church the last couple of years through people passing. Um, I hope they, I, they're all in our hearts and prayers too. So, before I forget, men's breakfast. Pastor Bill, you paying attention? <laughs> he thought it was the last two Saturdays. <laughs> Is 8 o'clock this Saturday, June 5th. Men's prayer breakfast will be here in the church. Um, a few weeks ago, I went to um, a church meeting with, with some of the board members and Pastor Bill and Mike Oldham, and Mike Oldham said something, Mike Oldham was leading it, and he said something that was just, it really caught me. And he was talking about rebuilding the church, rebuilding any church, not just ours, uh, probably about rebuilding our lives as well, but he said, when we're looking at our church, we all need to ask ourselves, are we here to serve or are we here to be served? Why, you know, why did we walk in this door today? To be served? Um, or did we walk in to choose to serve? And it you know, I thought about it and thought about it, and I thought, wow, that's just so great, you know, and we need to take that to church, and we need to talk about it there, and we need to figure out how we're going to continue to serve if that is the mission that we decide we are. First, you have, we have to make the choice, right? That's a question, so we have to make the choice. But what I really started thinking about was this lovely lady right here named Jody Fouts, who doesn't know us from Adam, who I don't know from Adam, but when Pastor Bill told me it was time to cut his hair, I said, oh, I will get right on that. No worries. So I, I looked up wigs for kids. There's nobody in Pueblo that supports wigs for kids, no hairstylists. And I could have called around and probably found somebody, but they had Colorado Springs hairstylists that support wigs for kids. And so I showed his name. And I called her up and I said, hi, I'm Karen, blah, 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 we're with the ecumenical church and our pastor's been growing out his hair. Would you, would you consider coming down to Pueblo West from, she's in Colorado Springs? Her immediate answer was yes. She chose to serve. She chose to serve this church. She's choosing to serve wigs for kids. She's, she's choosing to serve God. I mean, she just was all over it. No problem. Not how far are you, not how much, how are you going to pay me. As a matter of fact, I asked her what it would cost. She said, you won't owe me a thing. This is how I give back. You don't owe me a thing. So I would like to give her a big hand. <laughs> that being said, because we have grumbled and griped about Pastor Bill's hair for a really long time, I do think we should take an offering for wigs for kids. 
I know somebody put um, a check in here, and there were some other offerings in here. I transferred those to the other offering basket. Um, so if you put your regular tithing in this basket, I did transfer it for you. So this is going to be for wigs for kids. We're going to pass this basket. All the money goes to wigs for kids, every single penny. And Jody is going to explain to you a little bit more about wigs for kids, how they operate, and what they do. Thank you guys very much for having me and my family. Um, Wigs for Kids, I got involved with Wigs for Kids. The salon that I used to work at was considered an ambassador salon for Wigs for Kids, and I had a client that had been growing out her hair for, for quite a few years, and she wanted to donate it. And her first response to me when I told her that I was going to be changing salons we put my husband and our wonderful neighbor built a salon in my basement for me. So I work out of my home pretty much. And so when I told her that I was going to be moving, she kind of had a little bit of a panic attack because she says, where are you going to put my hair? And I said, don't worry. I'm going to sign up to become an ambassador salon for wigs for kids. And I... They, I get a newsletter every month from them, and they do wonderful things. I mean, I have heard different things about uh, locks of love, for one, is one of them. They actually charge the clients for the wigs. And Wigs for Kids is completely free. It's, um, you know, you do have to, I think locks of love only requires that you cut off seven inches, where Wigs for Kids is a little bit more, but... A lot of these little girls, are, they, they give to anybody, not just children. They give to anybody that is in need of a wig. And it's just beautiful. It's beautiful how it's a 100%, you know, nonprofit organization. So they go off of, you know, people, you know, giving and giving back. And through, through this whole process, I have always said, I will not charge for a haircut as long as you're donating. If you're able to donate your hair and I'm able to cut the amount of hair that is needed, you will not pay for a haircut. And um, I have, you know, met several different people that have had very hard times in their life. I've cut their hair. A couple of gentlemen that have lost their daughters to, you know, leukemia and lymphoma and cancer and everything. and it's, it's, it's touching. It, I am truly moved to be able to help people. And I lost my dad in January. And he, my dad was the best person in the world. And, you know, he, I want to live my life like my dad did. He gave back. He worked at the soup kitchen. And he loved it. He loved to serve. God and people and everybody and so I just you know but wigs for kids is a great you know they, they like I said I get the newsletter every month and they say about different wigs that they have given out or um, they do cut-a-thons um, in Colorado Springs there's a big high school it's Rampart High School they do a bald for bucks uh, assembly every single year they weren't able to do it this past year because of COVID and um, but they ask for stylists to come and donate their time and cut the it's a it's an amazing thing because the kids all the high schoolers they all put this assembly together they uh, you know they raise money for the leukemia and lymphoma foundation they pick a family to sponsor and um, I always love to go just to you know like I give back my time and give back to the community and but it's it's a wonderful thing i mean it's the kids are so happy when they're all done you know getting their hair cut they're high-fiving and there's music and it's a great thing so i just i love to be part of this to be able to help people and um but again i thank you for having me and my family here and uh, thank you for contacting me. I mean, it's it's a joy to be able to do this. So thank you very much.
sounds to me like God sent us the right person, don't you think? <laughs> I will put this back um, on the back on the right where it was, and if anybody didn't get a chance to put in, I'll, it'll be back there. And this money goes to Wigs for Kids. The one on the left is for our regular tithing. Ready for our song of worship? Joanne, I got you a lock. <laughs> oh, shoot. <laughs> you want to see the eyebrows go? Can you do his eyebrows, too? Can we do an eyebrow trim? Can we do an eyebrow trim, or is that? <laughs> um, before I forget, um, we are having a barbecue after service, so please don't forget that. Come and join us. There's plenty of Mike and Mike are cooking, so I'm not going to say great food, but there's plenty of food back there. <laughs> no, there's plenty of great food. So please join us for the barbecue. Um, again, Jody, thank you. You, you are a... We, we should all serve so openly. Please join me in the Apostles' Creed. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen.
looking good. <laughs> good morning. Our scripture this morning is Matthew 10, 29 through 31. Are not two sparrows sold for a, a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even to the even even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be <laughs> afraid. You are more for than many sparrows. <laughs> it's not often we read a scripture and find humor in it. That's pretty good. <laughs> May the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, and excuse me, your sight, the Lord, my rock and my redeemer. <laughs> Okay, we're moving into our moment of meditation. Um, can I have two elders volunteer to help with communion? Don't all go come at once. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. So during this time, um, there will be a nice song playing. And um, we would like you to take this time to meditate and bring forward any concerns that you have for the Lord and anything you want to be thankful for that we can bring forward in prayer. And we also ask during this time that you come forward and get your communion cup. service, so don't open your little cups yet. Our Heavenly Father, we bring forward to you everything that we are so thankful for. We have so many blessings, and we are thankful for armed service members that have made the sacrifices that are needed for our freedom. We're thankful for the ability to be able to serve, and we also have many, many prayer concerns. All of us do. We ask that you examine those and in your time do what is necessary for your plan 
we have had many losses this year in our church, and we pray for all those that are grieving. And we have many illnesses in our church as well. Some church members even hospitalized at this time. There's a list of prayer concerns in the bulletin. Please take time this week to pray in addition. Lord, we are so blessed. Thank you so much for everything that you have given us and given us the ability to be here today. Seeing so many smiles in this this building is just so, so beautiful to see. And we ask that you take all of our prayer concerns and, and just, just continue to bless us. In God's name, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Mike, there's a little left over. I, yeah. I, I, I bet you could even put it into a little wax and make a mustache like this. Well, this morning, I want to talk about hair. Really? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> um, it, it, you know, when I first started thinking about doing this, and immediately what came to my mind is, of course, you know, celebrating um, the, the haircut in honor of those who, uh, in our church and our friends and family, who are fighting cancer. And um, many of you don't know this, but the, the original plan for this was that Susan uh, was going to cut my hair, or at least participate in it. And so I'm A little bit sad that she's not here t to be a part of this because her and Randy were the ones that sort of hit, hit pretty close to us. But hair is, you know, I, I knew that I wanted to do a sermon on hair and so, you know, starting back months ago, I started kind of looking at all the places the Bible talks about hair and, and you know, kind of went, well, I, I think I can... I think I can pull together something here for a sermon. What I didn't realize when I started it is that hair and hairy and hairs, as in this stuff, are mentioned over a hundred times in Scripture. Did you realize that? Over a hundred times. Now, you know, not every mention of hair is, you know, significantly important. Um... Some of them are really very important. Um, in Genesis, um, you know, Esau and Jacob, you all remember who Esau and Jacob are, the sons of, of Abraham. Uh, we're told that when they were born, Esau was very hairy. Uh, in fact, it says he was hairy like a beast. That, it, you know, how hairy is that? We've all seen kids who were born with lots of hair and all that, right? Well, apparently Esau was so hairy that as an adult, when Jacob wanted to steal the birthright from his brother, do you know what he did in order to fool his father who was blind? He wore goat hair, goat skin, on his arms and, and you know, on his body so that when his father reached out, he would feel the goat hair and think that it was Esau. That's a hairy dude. Just saying. Um, in Exodus and Deuteronomy, goat hair was used to, for, to make the curtain for the tabernacle, the, the, the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the, from the holy place. The holy place was where the priests were, and then only the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies. When they were in the wilderness, it was, it was um, uh, Aaron 
the high, of the high priest. And it was a beautiful curtain that they made, not out of goat hide, but out of the hair. And I hadn't realized that, that goat hair could be um, so nice. And somebody said, well, uh, you know, Angora goats are, you know, like the silk or something. I thought, hmm, well, that's interesting. But also in Exodus and Deuteronomy told that, that baldness is not um, render a person unclean. They, they couldn't be a priest, but they weren't considered to be unclean or less than, uh, uh, you know. Men were told were not to cut the hair on the sides of their head. That's why when you see Hasidic Jews with the, with the hair hanging down here, because in, Levit in Leviticus, that's one of the commandments that's given to men is that they wouldn't uh, trim their beard or cut the hair on the sides of their head. Um, and then, of course, everybody sort of heard a little bit about the Nazarite vow. A Nazarite vow was when a person who wanted to get, dedicate themselves to God uh, for either a short term or a long term, they were taking a vow to be of service to God. Um, they would, during that time period, they couldn't drink alcohol or uh, eat honey, or, I mean, there was a whole host of things that they didn't do, but one of them was they didn't cut their hair at all. Um, and, of course, in Judges, we get one of the big examples of, uh, uh, of a Nazarite, and that was Samson. And we all have heard the story about Samson and how he, he grew his hair out, and it was very beautiful, and he was really a, a, a macho kind of guy, and, and he kept his vow. He served Israel as its sort of judge or as a, a warlord, if you would, uh, for, you know, for a bunch of years. But he kind of got proud of his hair and uh, let slip to his Philistine girlfriend that, that it, you know, the secret of his strength and success was in his hair. And so when he went to sleep, she cut all his hair off. And he, he was able then to be captured and uh, thrown into, into Philistine prison where he kind of languished until his hair started to grow back. And at one point, the Philistines made a, uh, a, an example of him. They had him chained between pillars of the, of the big building where they were all having a big, a big you know, powwow and, and feast and all that stuff. And he had regained his strength and he pulled the pillars in and collapsed the building onto himself and all of the, the Philistines who were gathered there. Kind of a gruesome story, isn't it? Then there's Absalom. You know, Absalom was the, uh, about the third son or so of David, uh, but by the time he is a young man, uh, through various circumstances, some a little bit nefarious, he's probably the oldest son of David. And Absalom is known for his incredible beauty, and he was very proud of it, and he, he had really, really long hair um, that, that um, well, at one point it says they weighed it, and it was uh, two, 200 shekels is what it weighed, and I, so I had to look that up and find out that 200 uh, shekels is about five pounds. I didn't have five pounds of hair there, did I? I did I have a pound? Maybe about a pound? Yeah, and so you figure, like, double or triple the amount of hair that was on my head. That's a, that's a lot of hair. He was very proud of it, and, and, and at one point it was predicted or prophesied that not a single hair of his head would fall to the ground. Now, I, I'm going to explain more about that later on, uh, because that's quite an interesting prophecy. In Proverbs, gray hair is a crown of splendor. It is attained by living <laughs> a righteous life. The glory of young men is their strength. Gray hair is the splendor of the old, right? You know? I've always told people when my hair started turning gray, it was a mark of wisdom. Um, usually it was trauma, and uh, <laughs> that's how we get wisdom sometimes. Uh, one of my favorites, one of my favorites, though, is, is this passage from Song of Solomon, where Solomon is writing a love poem, right? It, it, it's, it's, it's pouring his heart out to his beloved. He wants this woman to really know how, how wonderful he thinks she is. And so he says, your hair is like a flock of goats. <laughs> e either he had weird tastes 
or some really nice looking goats. <laughs> you know, it really doesn't explain it to us, but it, you know, it's like, you know, honey, if I told you you had hair like a flock of goats, yeah, she'd kill me. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew 10, 30, 31. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Right? Sometimes we get lost in the what if. And we forget just a very simple, basic fact. And that is, is that God understands everything about us, about you as an individual. And that, that, you know, not a hair falls from your head that God doesn't know about. You know, uh, when you stop and you think about seven to eight billion people on this planet, God's keeping track of all of them. And then you think back through the history of time, the billions upon billions of trillions of people, and God has kept track of every single one. Every single one. Luke and John both recount the story of a woman who, um, who dried Jesus' feet with her hair. In Acts, Paul cuts off his hair because of a vow he made. We're, we're not told what the vow was. We're not told if he, you know, there were two reasons why you cut your hair after having made a vow. One was you fulfilled the requirements of the vow, or the other was you'd blown it and you started all over again. And so your hair was cut and you'd either start again or celebrate because you kept your vow. I vowed that I would let my hair grow long enough for it to be donated to Wigs for Kids. And um, I, I have to tell you, I went through a little bit of a panic when at about six or seven inches, I was started looking at wigs for kids and discovered, no, if you have gray hair, it's got to be 12 to 14 inches. And it's like, oh, okay, um, here we go again. <laughs> I was tempted to cut it all off and start again. No, not. <laughs> In 1 Corinthians and 1 Timothy, uh, they both refer to Jewish customs and, and um, cultural things about hair, about the length of men's hair, about the length of women's hair, whether you wear a hair covering or all those kinds of things. And and it's it kind of some interesting things in there. But my favorite story about hair goes back to Solomon. Well, it's one of my favorites. I, I didn't mention that uh, there is a great story about the prophet I, um, Eze uh, Elijah, who some kids started teasing him because he was bald. And uh, so he called bears down to eat him. Strange story. So the story about Absalom, though, is my favorite. A Absalom was, um, he, he, he's such an interesting character because he is everything that the populace likes and loves in a leader. He um, decides, though, that his father's time is kind of kind of passed, and it's time for him to sort of be king. And so he, he begins the process of going down to the city gate in Jerusalem and just sort of being there as a judge. People would bring to him things that they might bring to the king. Oh, you don't want to bother with the king. So they'd stop to see Absalom and, and you know, um, this, this guy's sheep got into it with my sheep and, you know, and he went ahead and butchered it and ate it. And, and so he would make a judgment. Okay, here's what you do. You give him one of your best sheep back. And, and he sort of garnered a lot of, of favor among the populace. And I as this went on, he became more and more popular to the point where he was more popular than David. And he was ready to, to, to you know, I mean, he, would, he, he was one of the few people who had a chariot, which in those days was like, you know, a Corvette. And he'd, he'd ride it up and down the streets of Jerusalem all over the place, kind of showing off his cool chariot with his hair flowing behind him. He was handsome and tough and rugged. And, and, and you know, all the girls, ooh, and all the guys, ooh, I want, you know, I want a chariot too. 
it, during that period, somebody prophesied that not one hair of Absalom's head would fall to the ground. Well, that sort of make you feel blessed, right? Like, like if that is what is prophesied about you, you can do no wrong. And Absalom went into full rebellion against his father, King David. And in fact, the 23rd Psalm was written probably during David's time of exile where David had to take his family and a few friends and they fled Jerusalem with Absalom and an army behind him chasing him. And so when David writes, you know, yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, that's an actual place. And he was afraid for his life and the life of everyone with him because had Absalom caught them, he would have wiped them all out, killed them all. Those loyal to David flee with David. And we, at a certain point, the tide turns. And, and Absalom, you, you know, this great, handsome, you know, great leader, um, he loses a, a battle and winds up running from David's men. And he's on a donkey, and he's, he's riding through this area that's got a lot of oak trees. Now remember what it said, not a hair of his head would fall to the ground. What they didn't tell him was that as he was riding through this oak forest, that long, lovely, beautiful hair got caught in the branches of an oak tree, and he got pulled off his donkey, and he was hanging helpless from a tree. And David's men came on him and they killed him. And when David, when the news was reported to David that Absalom, his son, had been killed, you would think David's response would have been, Woohoo, I'm safe, we're all safe. No, David's response was, Absalom, Absalom, oh my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Absalom, Absalom, oh my son, Absalom. Now, I, I remember the first time I read that. And I remember going, there's something here, but I don't know quite what it is. That's just really an interesting story. And, and the way that, that Absalom died and David's response, but I don't know what to make of it. A bunch of years later, I started thinking about that passage again. And it made me, made me think about how, in the same way that Absalom had rebelled against his father, the king, I rebel against God, my father. You rebel against God, our father when we do the things that we know we're not supposed to do, when we, when we treat people with anything less than w grace and love, we are rebelling against God, our Father. When, one day when I was sitting and reading this, it, 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 again, I, I, at first I kind of went, that's such a strange passage. But then it was that little whisper of the Holy Spirit in my ear Bill. Bill. Oh, my son. Bill. If only I could die for you. And I realized in that moment the reality is that Absalom's death was a picture of Jesus' death for us. There was no more shameful way for a person to die than hanging from a tree. Jesus on the cross, Absalom with his pride wrapped up into his hair, hanging from an oak tree. And I realized God had died for me. He took my place in Jesus. 
such a such an amazing thing that God loves us so much. It, it, David's love for Absalom is just a, a, a beginning of the picture of God's love for us. David didn't have the ability to have stepped in and died and taken the place of Absalom. But God looked at us in our rebellion and said, I'm going to step in. And he became one of us. In fact, if it had only been us who are here today, gathered around Jesus, he would have let us crucify him. so that he could take the place, so that he could bear the penalty of our rebellion. Giving up my hair, that's, that's not a big sacrifice. By the way, is it just me or is it cold in here? <laughs> you know... Jody coming and, and, and cutting my hair, giving of her time, that's a bigger sacrifice than me giving up my hair. Many of you come and you help with the, with the pantry, and that's a, that's a giving up of your life and your time. That's, that's a bigger thing than the spectacle of me getting my hair cut. But at the end of the day, the biggest sacrifice is still the sacrifice of God the Father giving of His only Son. And whoever would believe in Him would have eternal life. Amen? I just had to do that. I want you to know it's good to be with, here with you. The last two weeks I've been in Silverton. I go there and do the service and preach. I'll be here this week, there next week, here the next week, and there the next week. So it's good to be with you. And I want to say something about are we here to serve or to be served? And my answer is both. If we serve and you don't accept that serving, then what good is that? So each of us has to learn to accept being served as well as to serve. And I just think that's really important. At the Last Supper, Jesus was gathered together with his people just like we are today. He had an awesome meal. And then he took some bread. He blessed it. So let's take out your bread. It's always a challenge to figure out how to get that undone. But he took his bread, he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take ye all and eat of this, for this is my body, which will be given for you, which will be broken for you. Take and eat. And then he took the cup, he blessed it, gave it to his disciples, and said, take ye all and drink of this, for this is my blood, which will be shed for you. Take and drink. We've had 2,000 years to understand what that meant. Picture the disciples the apostles sitting around having him say, this is my body. And they go, no, it's a piece of bread. And they, he says, no, this is, represents my body. This is my body. I'm fixing to die for you. And then he says, take the wine. This is my blood. It doesn't look like blood to me. It looks like wine. 
taste like wine. But Jesus says, no, this is my blood, which will be shed for you. We've had 2,000 years to understand the unbelievable depth of God's love for us. We cannot take that lightly. We have to live our lives realizing that we understand that just as he died for us, we're to give of ourselves to one another and to all God's people. Testing, one, two, there we go. Okay. One hand towards God, one hand extended toward your neighbor. And by neighbor, I don't mean the people just standing near you or the people in the house next door, right? Because what we learned from Jesus is that everyone that we meet is our neighbor. So remember that as you leave this place, that God has reached out to you in order that you might reach out to others. Go in peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's join the band in singing Old Church Choir. And uh, we are, are adjourned to the fellowship hall. You're all invited to stay uh, for burgers and hot dogs and their salads and, and uh, uh, new benches to celebrate on and, and in the fellowship hall today because it's a little chilly outside and in here. <laughs> Let's join them. Oh, <laughs> i